Hi, I'm Sunil Badami and welcome to another Roaring Stories online author event here at the beautiful Royal Oak Hotel in Sydney's Balmain and on Facebook Live. I'd like to acknowledge Elders past, present and future of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land we now meet. Never ceded, always was, always is and always will be Gadigal land, especially this week, NADOC week. Now, before we begin, a little bit of um, housekeeping. You're welcome to take photos, but please remember to turn your flash off and feel free to share your pictures and your thoughts on any of our social media channels. That's Instagram, that's Twitter, that's Facebook, and any others I am too old to know about. <laughs> Um, do check out our social media and if you'd like to ask a question, you'll have time for questions after the event. Uh, please feel free to ask them then. I'll repeat them for our audience at home. If you're on Facebook Live or Twitter, why don't you ask us a question there as well. Make sure you hashtag with Roaring Stories. Well, doesn't it seem just like a few years ago that our relationship with China seemed to be the start of a beautiful friendship? From vitamins to baby formula, coal to education, China quickly became one of our biggest and most important trading partners. And yet, it seems that once beautiful relationship has soured very quickly. All of a sudden, we have lobsters rotting on the tarmac, exports like beef, barley, wine and coal sitting out in docks and our most important exports either being restricted with tariffs or banned altogether. How did it get so bad so quickly? It seems that as China has risen as a global superpower and sought to exert and assert its influence over the world, whether across Asia, in the South China Sea, or in Australia's own backyard in the South Pacific, as well as its influence upon Australian politics, China's rise is increasingly being viewed by many around the world, especially in the West, with suspicion. And yet, despite with the rise of Donald Trump, populism, the shock of Brexit, and the trend, growing trend of authoritarian regimes around the world which seem to ignore basic human rights, it seems that what was once a new world order has been thrown into the dustbin of history. Australia seems to be negotiating a very tricky path between its strategic allies like the US and its trading partners like China. Around the world, governments are seeking to limit China's growing power and conflicts between the Chinese government and the world are increasing as China seeks to address its, assert itself more stridently and some might say a little too aggressively. So how can we manage those important relationships with the world, our allies and our trading partner, especially when their culture and policies often seem so at odds with our own? How can we avoid further punishment by an increasingly imperial China while standing up for what we believe in? Can we see beyond the popular or populist image of China as an adversary and find new ways to cooperate with those around the world, especially those rising powers in Asia? And how can we avoid the rise of authoritarianism and populism that has infected so many other democracies? Former ambassador to China, Jeff Raby, has written an important book, China's Grand Strategy and Australia's Future in the New Global Order, which may contain some answers for how Australia must position itself in this possibly dystopian future. Taking place amidst the intense debate over our increasingly tense relationship with this ascendant global superpower, this important discussion promises to be riveting and enlightening. And I'd like to introduce our guests tonight. Jeff Raby was Australia's ambassador to China between 2007 and 2011, ambassador to APEC between 2003 and 2005, and ambassador to the World Trade Organization between 1998 and 2001. He's the chairman of Viz Asia at the Art Gallery of New South Wales and chairman of the Australia China Institute of Arts and Culture at the University of Western Australia and was awarded the Order of Australia last year for services to Australia China relations and to international trade. Geraldine Doog, does she need any introduction? 
a media legend inducted into the Australian Media Hall of Fame in 2018. She's been a reporter for The West Australian, The Australian, 2UE, Channel 10, and was host of ABC TV's Nationwide in the 1980s, which was one of my favourite shows after Neighbours, I have to tell you. <laughs> Geraldine has received a number of prestigious awards for her work, including United Nation, the United Nations Media Peace Prize and two Penguins Awards for her central role in the ABC's coverage of the first Gulf War in 1991, as well as receiving or being awarded a Churchill Fellowship for social and cultural reporting in 2000 and an Order of Australia for distinguished service on issues involving ethics, values, religion and social change. The creator and inaugural presenter of Radio National's Life Matters program, she's now the presenter of RN's Saturday Extra, which specialises in foreign policy, regional issues, agenda-changing commentators and good books. She's also the author of 2005's Tomorrow's Islam, Uniting Age-Old Beliefs in a Modern World, and 2014's The Climb, Conversations with Australian Women in Power. Ladies and gentlemen, here in the Royal Oak and on Facebook, please welcome Geraldine Duke and Jeff Rayburn. Thank you very much indeed, Sunil. There's a great quote from Nicholas Tomlin, actually, who was one of the better-known members of my profession. Um, the only qualities necessary for real success in journalism, such as you described, there are rat-like cunning, a plausible manner, and a little literary ability. So <laughs> <laughs> that just brings me down to words when I hear, a, hear a, a CV like that. And look, thank you. It's lovely. It's lovely to be here tonight, um, and lovely to be sitting with Jeff, uh, you know, whom I have spoken to for many years on Saturday Extra. Um, and in fact, I was very annoyed with him the other day because he went on R in Breakfast with Fran Kelly first <laughs> with his book, and uh, I've admonished him. Um, and I'll now uh, have to wait because we try very hard not to overlap too obviously. So I'll now. <laughs> have to wait to reconvene some sort of other end of year discussion with Jeff on this, I agree with Sunil, very important book. And I mean, Jeff and I have been talking about this for years, actually. Um, I've known Jeff for, for quite a few years, both inside China and outside China. And, you know, I've known Jeff has wanted to do this, um, but, you know, sitting down and assembling it is really the demanding thing. And it's, it's a very good book. And it's, it's beautifully put together. Um, you can feel the diplomat and the economist in you that's, uh, you know, um, summarised beautifully, I think. And I hope we can do justice to it. And we'll sort of talk for about half an hour and then I think we'll throw it open to you for questions. But I wanted to quote something I pulled out. I mean, you know, what extraordinary times uh, to, be, to be speaking to Jeff in. Um, Robert Kaplan, who is a, a, a big foreign policy man in America, um, he wrote recently, um, the next administration, therefore, has to sit down, this is America we're talking about, <laughs> I think it's pertinent to us too, uh, the next administration, therefore, has to sit down with the Chinese leadership and arrange a calendar of regular summits, a process that forces their respective bureaucracies to come up with markers for progress on a range of issues. Now, you, I presume you would agree with that, Jeff? Very much. Um, you also, you, you say, you, I didn't realise you actually you'd quoted him in here. I wanted to add that you always wanted to call your book Prometheus Bound. Yes. <laughs> and it's there, in there, I think it's chapter five or something, it's isn't a it? Third, third second, chapter. It's a third section. Third sorry, section. Second section. The second section is Prometheus Bound. And you didn't. I mean, it, some, yeah. somebody yeah. in, you know, said, no, you've got to call it Marketing China, China's grand University strategy Press. in Australia's yes. future, <laughs> the new government. Who's Prometheus? <laughs> but, I mean, why, why, why did you want to call it Prometheus Bound? I think it's, it says a lot. Okay, look. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, and uh, um, great to be here and have this opportunity. And uh, with Roaring Stories, thank you for arranging it, and Geraldine for giving up your time. It's fantastic to sit here and have this opportunity to discuss this with you. Um, and it helps me a lot because I'm doing the uh, I'm doing the National Press Club uh, tomorrow because their um, their better guests dropped out at short notice, and I was hanging around with an empty diary, so to speak. So, so I need to practice this evening. <laughs> That's very important for me. Um, Look, uh, I just wanted to touch on the Kaplan um, point, and I, I do think Kaplan is very important, and I do quote him at length in my book, um, and I'm very much attracted to 
his uh, geopolitical realist approach to international relations and foreign policy. I think that's very, very important uh, that we in Australia have more of a realist view around foreign policy uh, than I think we've had up until now. Um, Prometheus Bound is the notion that uh, China is an ascendant superpower, but its path and trajectory of ascendancy is very, very different to that of the United States uh, when it started its global ascendancy after the Civil War in the 1860s. Uh, I've been very uh, influenced by Hugh White's book of, uh, I can't believe how quickly the time goes, but eight years ago, the uh, China Choice book. Many people never read the book, but from the title, thought they'd figured out what the book was about, believed it was Australia's China Choice. But it's not that, it's the United States' China Choice. And it basically says, look, uh, China is this massive ascendant power the US has a choice. It can resist the rising China. And remember, this is eight years ago, before uh, Obama and the pivot. Um, uh, or it can provide strategic space to accommodate China's legitimate ambitions as a rising power. He said, whatever choice the US will make will have absolutely profound implications for Australia and Australia's future. His own recommendation was that the US should cede strategic space to China in the interest of avoiding war. He was hounded by the media for being um, uh, an appeaser. It was a nonsense. The whole issue around appeasement is a nonsense. Um, but I had a problem uh, with that because I thought, well, look, um, China can't... Uh, exercise geopolitical reach and power. It's got constraints. And hence I worked through the constraints and came to the notion of Prometheus Bound. So the second section of the book is called Prometheus Bound and it goes through the four constraints on China's exercise of power. And the contrast with the United States and its ascendancy, as I mentioned earlier, will be obvious. I mean, the first one is geography. China has 14 countries on its border and 22,000 kilometers of land border to defend. That's massive. And most of those countries, China has been in conflict with sometime in recent memory. Uh, secondly, the constraint of history. China is still an empire with unresolved territorial issues inside its border. Uh, since I was thinking of these things, of course, issues like Xinjiang have become very prominent. Tibet, we've always known about. Taiwan, of course, and now, as I say, thanks to Beijing's own ineptitude, Hong Kong has now become a major territorial uh, security issue for Beijing to manage. And the resources of managing those internal security threats are massive. And I've got some graphs and things in the book which show that in the last uh, eight or 10 years, China's expenditure, as much as you can trust the numbers and you can only work with what you've got, but China's expenditure on internal security has vastly outstripped China's expenditure on external security, on its military and its navies. So that is a major constraint for China. But the third one, and one which is never really discussed, and I don't understand why, frankly, particularly from Australian analysts, because we've been at the forefront of it, is China's um, resource constraints. For 3,000 years, China was a very rich country. And it still is today, except for from the 50s when Mao decided population growth was a, a form of national security, they ended up with a lot of people. And that didn't matter because they're poor, really poor. And then sometime in the 1990s, China gets richer and richer, and it goes through these tipping points. So by 1995, China is self-sufficient in crude oil. Five years later, which isn't actually a great period of time in the Chinese scheme of things. Five years later, they're a major net oil importer. Another five years on, and they are the world's single largest importer of crude oil. And the same with iron ore and everything. And of course, that leads to the first decade of uh, this uh, century with the, uh, with the uh, uh, resources super cycle. And resource prices went nuts. And we were actually at the forefront of that because iron ore, more than anything else, um, became the critical 
resource that China needed to, to keep all of its economic growth going. And of course, it needs to maintain economic growth as it's part of its social compact with its people. The Chinese people basically accept the Communist Party running the show, uh, providing their lives are getting better year on year and their stability. And that's what the Communist Party delivered, and they delivered with massive economic growth. But all of that is steel intensive. And steel requires iron ore, and Australia has you know, the best resources and we're the most uh, competitive and we're the closest to China in terms of sailing time. And so we ended up at the forefront of what I call in the book the iron ore wars. Because all this happened so quickly, Geraldine, that the leadership in Beijing has got no idea what's going on. The, the economic reforms and everything were never intended for China to integrate in the international system. Well, it, it, that's not what the rest of the world thought. Well, on the basis, well, no, it, it was on the basis of uh, Ricardian comparative advantage. It was basically mercantilist. You trade, you export, you have uh, uh, requirements on on companies if they come into your country and transfer technology and they must export and whatever. It was a very much a mercantilist model, not a Ricardian model of comparative advantage. And so the leadership in Beijing, I, I say in the book, and I've just made this up, I, I, but, but you can imagine sometime in about like 2004, someone in Jungnanhai, the leadership compound, wakes up at 2 a.m. and starts screaming at the ceiling, saying, what have we done? This was never meant to happen. We are utterly dependent on the rest of the world, utterly. And for 3,000 years, it's never been the case. And guess what? All of that stuff, all the iron ore, all the crude oil, all the bauxite, everything goes through the Straits of Malacca and the South China Sea. And in Beijing, suddenly they realise that they have created for themselves, unwittingly, an unintended consequence, a massive, uh, a massive strategic vulnerability because the US, in a heartbeat, can close the Straits of Malacca or the South China Sea. So if you sort of wonder why China's so exercised about the South China Sea, from a Beijing perspective, there is a massive security vulnerability and they're totally paranoid about it. Now, all of us sitting here know the US won't chose close the Straits of Malacca or the South China Sea, or maybe we don't know that. But if you're in Beijing, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean you're not being followed. So. You can understand where they're coming from. And the last one, quickly, Geraldine, is just to say the fourth constraint that bounds Prometheus is soft power. You can't exercise influence just through military means or sharp power. You exercise with a combination of hard and soft power. But China's soft power is constrained because the, the soft power narrative must work through the Communist Party. And although that stuff might sell well in China, it's, it's hopeless overseas. And so China has great difficulty in projecting soft power. And I, again, don't have any real numbers. I don't know. There are some numbers. I'm not sure how real they are. But, but I basically say, look, of all of the Chinese state's wasteful state-directed investment, because I am an economist at the end of the day, probably the most wasteful has been the money they've spent on CGTV global television. Because if you look at the Pew polls mm. of international standing of China, the more they've spent on soft power, the more the so there will be other factors. But anyway, sorry, John. No, well, you've got a great uh, quote. I was going to come to that. Um, the uh, writing a decade ago on how other countries would respond to China's emergence as a great power. The noted strategic policy academic and commentator Wang Jizi, who yeah. was then dean of the School of International Studies at Peking University, said, and this is a great perceptive quote: "China will have to invest." Tremendous resources to promote a more benign image on the world stage. A China with good governance will be a likeable China. Even more important, it will have to learn that soft power cannot be artificially created. Yeah. Such influence originates more from a society than from a state. Exactly. That's an yes. extraordinary quote, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I take it that you believe there's no chance, the, the state will remain what we now see for a while? Oh, absolutely. The party state is there. Um, I mean, a, a big part of the title is China's grand strategy. It's the first sort of concept I introduce. And I see China's grand strategy as having two main elements. One is territorial integrity. Because remember, when the Communist Party came to power in 1949, they didn't inherit a state. They didn't take over a state or a nation, as we understand it. 
they occupied fragments of territory, shards, which had fallen apart over 100 years of civil disturbance, Japanese occupation, you name it. And they had in 1949 to begin building from all these fragments a state. And that was the first part of the Communist Party nation building project. So having done that so painfully, they're going to protect that at all costs. But of course, the other element is to maintain the power and role of the Communist Party. And the two are sort of connected. I think people feel and understand in China without a strong central leadership, in this case, in the form of the Communist Party, you're not going to hold the country together and you'll descend back in chaos. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't hold the country together, if you don't protect every inch, and hence why things like uh, Hong Kong or Xinjiang peripheral security all become so such acute issues for the Communist Party, we sort of look and say, well, what's, what's the big deal? No one's going to bloody break off Xinjiang from Beijing, of mainland of the rest of China. But they're acute issues because uh, they would, if they lost a, a millimetre, the leader would fall and the legitimacy of the Communist Party would be destroyed. So these two things reinforce each other massively. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so yes, you will have the party state continuing. And its legitimacy derives from its ability to deliver the economic goods. That's why um, for years I've been giving speeches saying, don't worry about the economy. The Chinese economy will grow. Uh, it has to, because the government needs that to happen. Uh, for the rest, the real thing to worry about is the uh, fragility of the political system. In, I wanted to quote Peter Varghese, who was our for, former head of uh, foreign affairs with whom you worked and now Chancellor of Queensland University. And he wrote a piece again the other day, he said it before, constrain, don't contain China. Uh, because that word contain is such a loaded mm. word in, in foreign yep. policy. Now, um, do, do you agree with that? And for, for a lot of ordinary Australians, what does that mean, constrain, don't contain? Yeah. Um, it, it, Peter's got neat phrases. Uh, I've worked with him for a long time. I, I think what he's talking about, and I deal with it in the book as well, is the difference between containment and hedging. Hmm. So it's, it sounds subtle, but there's actually a very big difference. Uh, I mean, containment doesn't recognise or accept the legitimacy of a rising power and its claims. Hedging says, yep, you know, we recognise your rise, we recognise the legitimacy of your place in the world, but you've got to behave well. And, you know, it's the old cliche from the Peloponnesian War. You know, great powers do what they will and the rest of us do what we can. But that's the reality. And all great powers, powers uh, behave badly whether it's the UK, whether it's the United States. I mean, if, if, if you had come from a subcontinent background, you wouldn't think of uh, Imperial Britain as a very well-behaved country. If you come from Latin America or the Caribbean or something, you wouldn't think of the Monroe Doctrine of the United States as a very agreeable framework for foreign policy. Great powers behave badly. All we can do as small powers or little countries is work out how to hedge that. Work out, and I think this is what Peter's saying, I mean, work out how... Uh, we can show the great power that bad behaviour carries costs. But how do we do that? Well, I mean, with China, you can do it a number of ways. Um, you can, I mean, China's, China's pushed back, well, China's behaved assertively in the South China Sea, uh, but it's lost a lot of support across the region as a result. Mm. And there's a lot of suspicion has increased. Uh, we could have, uh, we could, could have coalitions of countries uh, that are prepared to take action on China. Like us and Japan and Singapore, is that what you yeah, mean? Yeah, Indo and Indonesia, yeah. And, and particularly coalitions that really would hurt China. I mean, if it's just like the Quad, which I'm very critical of, and I'm happy to go into that, um, but if it's just sort of, uh, you know, the US whistling up Japan, us and India, well, for China, that's containment. Hmm. And it doesn't really mean a lot because their attitude is those countries would behave like that in any case. But if you get in the Philippines and Indonesia, and we're now, which I think is very good, getting closer to Vietnam. And I must say, as a, as a footnote, if I may, um, the Vietnam stuff is fascinating because we, our government and our foreign ministry bang on endlessly about shared values and relationships and so on. We don't share any values with Vietnam. Vietnam is a one-party, authoritarian, <laughs> communist state with a terrible human rights record. 
well, who does that sound like? <laughs> but, yeah. but they can't help it in Canberra. They just have a sort of like a machine. You put the penny in and, and off it runs. Values, protecting our interests. Well, but, okay, I'll take that up there. But one of the things this is know, a hedging strategy. This is yeah. a hedging strategy. Because, in fact, you make the point that Europe has become mm. increasingly concerned, or, or nettled, mm. shall we say, about China. But it remains engaged, uh, and it basically sort of says you, you can walk and chew gum. I think that's whereas we don't seem to be doing that. Yep. And so, yeah, and a lot of us people will be sitting here tonight waiting to ask a question to say, well, how do we live with this? You know, yeah. how how do we really cop uh, that type of belligerence? Yeah. Well, I have to acknowledge first of all, it's very difficult. It's a huge challenge. And we have never had to deal with this in our entire history. I mean, Alan Gingell's uh, very fine book, uh, Fear of Abandonment, captures it in that brilliant title. We had Pax Britannica and then Pax US. We never had to think about these things. We never had to take diplomacy seriously. And if you ask, well, what does the book end up really saying after all those words and all of that effort? We need to invest more in diplomacy. We can never spend enough militarily to defend ourselves. We cannot rely on the United States to just come to our aid, our aid whenever... Especially now. Yeah, especially now, when we think we need it. They don't have the will, they don't have the interest. It's all changed. As Alan says, and that book's about three years old, we, are, we have been abandoned. We are on our own. So we have to become smart diplomats, like European states have had to do for a very long time. And specifically, you know, we do need to spend more on defence. We need to harden that. We need to spend more on cyber security. That has to be hard. We should have anti-domestic foreign interference laws. We need to harden that, that up. But equally, we need to decide um, whether we have a, an attitude and a stance towards China, which is one essentially of containment or one of engagement. And I think for Australia, there's only one answer, and that is we need to engage with China. It does happen to be, by a country mile, our largest trading partner and our economic future depends on it. And um, critical to national security is economic security. If you don't have a strong economy, you're not going to have any national security. Let's get into that. But let's get into how what that would be like. Because I everybody dances around this and you have and I really find this difficult in you know trying to sort of broadcast um, to people that you say sort of you both show your annoyance and yet you engage. Now that reminds, you know, we like to parody the old British Foreign Office people who were sort of slippery, duplicitous, you know, had perfidious words, Albion. Perfidious Albion. Yeah. And, and they were very, very good diplomats. Yeah. Of course, they had the power of the, you know, the British Empire behind yeah. them. But we tended to characterise them as sort of, you know, oh, well, you can't trust them. Is that what we've got to become like? Have we got to sort of try to speak with forked tongue? No. In fact, I say in the book, if we, you know, as you develop hedging strategies, they have to be transparent. We have to talk to China about it. We have to tell them we're hedging. I think a big part of it, Geraldine, and we have to ask ourselves this question, how is it that we have positioned ourselves as an outlier? You mentioned Europe's pissed off with China. Europeans aren't the only ones. Everyone is annoyed with China, and it's overweening, assertive, uh, bullying behaviour from time to time. But we're the only ones that have got our diplomatic relations completely frozen. And suffering. Canada's not exactly in a great spot, is it? No, but it's, it, you know, we've managed. Hmm. And we don't have anywhere near the problems Canada has. You know, and Canada is nowhere near as dependent on China no. as we are. Right. I mean, I think our politicians are just utterly misleading. There is a certain reality. The United States' interests with China are quite different than ours. China accounts for about 20% of US exports. It's 40% of ours. You know, it, it's, it's vastly different. So if we want to take a big cut in our living standards, sure, we can continue to behave the way we're behaving and China will probably make us pay. Maybe not. I don't really know where that all ends. But back, I mean, back to your point, it's so often a question of how we present, hmm. what we say and how we say it. And we don't need to have, for example, on the South China Sea, as we did in 2016 with the Hague Judgment, we don't need to have the most strident voice of anyone who has an interest in that. As Kevin Rudd said, and Geraldine will know I have a long history with Kevin, I don't usually agree with him over much, and I like to think he was actually influenced a bit by this. On Sunday morning on Insiders, he made the same point. But he had a lovely example of Japan. Japan, as Kevin said on, on, on Sunday morning, 
almost every day over the Senkaku Dayu Islands. They're, they're, they're stalking each other with ships and planes, and the stuff's happening almost every day. Yet Japan has perfectly normal diplomatic relations with China. The foreign ministers meet in a trilateral with South Korea. Uh, you know, the other another good example is just recently, before the Osmin talks, the Americans have been trying to get us to sign up to FONOPS, the Freedom of Navigation Operations in the South China Sea. That means sailing inside the eight kilometer uh, nautical exclusion zone that China has unilaterally declared and which is disputed internationally. The Americans are insisting on doing that to directly challenge China. We're lucky the Australian Navy is smart enough to know not to join. Our politicians would, or some of them. But the Navy saying, look, if China's going to make a, a, an example of anyone, they're not going to do it of a US aircraft group. But an Australian frigate would be a very nice way of making a point. So we don't do that. But to compensate the Americans, when we had this sail through the South China Sea, but that was purely international waters, it wasn't a FONOPS exercise. And I'm sorry if this is a bit technical, but get this. The US had a, bar a, a, a carrier battle group, massive. You know, It's got everything you can imagine. And fair enough. Um, we had five assets. That's probably the largest sort of assembly of Australian assets <laughs> in an operation. And guess what the Japanese contributed? One. From a Navy multiple times bigger than ours. So if you're sitting in Beijing, and this is so much the point of what I keep trying to say in my book, if you sit in Beijing, you say, hmm, okay, they're making a point to us. We get it. Of course, you get a aircraft fleet through, that's what the Americans do. Why is Australia sending like two thirds of its entire navy? <laughs> and then they look at the one Japanese asset and they say, those poor Japanese, they're, they've been so beaten up by the Americans to contribute something. It, you know, it costs them a ship to get the Americans out their front door, to get them away from them. But that's, I mean, that's how Beijing would read it. It's a great power. Mm. It's not deluded by this or anything. What it would notice more than anything else is we had five and, and Japan had one. had one. And that speaks volumes. And that's what diplomacy is all about. But my assertion, not so much in the book, but in my AFR columns, is that our foreign policy has been completely hijacked by the defence intelligence security establishment, who don't think in diplomatic and nuanced terms, but just think about making displays of power and force. Well, in fact, you even say it, it looks as though um, uh, Australia has deliberately set about making the Chinese leadership lose face. Well, absolutely. And there are a couple of examples of that. One was uh, the Huawei ban. I don't know what the technical reality is. Is Huawei a threat? I would notice that the British uh, persisted with Huawei for many years in spite of US pressure until just this year when they came under extreme pressure to allow Huawei to participate in something like 30% of the 5G network. I have no idea about the technical arguments, and if the technical arguments are Huawei's a threat and it should be banned, fine. But you don't have to, as Malcolm Turnbull did, ring Donald Trump the next day and, and boast to him what a great act Australia has done in banning Huawei. You don't have to be the first. You may not have had to do it comprehensively. But for God's sake, government tenders are closed. You could have said, sure, Huawei can tender, and they were competitive, and no one can challenge the tenders. Uh, the Prime Minister most recently, with his call for an um, independent inquiry on uh, the origins of COVID-19, nothing wrong with that. Perfectly reasonable that people will want to know how this happened, how do we prepare against it. Wouldn't it be better, though, to be able to speak to the Chinese about it and say, we've got this gr great new, new beautiful idea that uh, we should have a, a really good open, open inquiry. And guess what? We have a dozen other countries who agree with us. And so we're going to float this as an international initiative. Well, you do say sort of, what's your language? I mean, there are a range of things you basically think. That's what you really say. What's your language, you know, as you, yep. in, when you're dealing in this? Look, because I, I know I want to ha allow people to uh, ask questions, but uh, maybe this is, this is a marvellous, again, on page 153, as Alan Gingell argues, fear of abandonment lies deep within Australia's foreign policy and public attitudes to its place in the world. Quoting what content from yes. the first fleet, which arrived in Sydney Cove in 1788, Gingell writes that every morning from daylight until the sun sunk, did we sweep the horizon in the hope of seeing a sail. This is what content. 
After the British Empire, then Pax Americana, Australia now finds itself again having to confront its existential fear of abandonment and how this small group of people can protect an audacious claim to a vast continent. Gingell's writing of the early colonists, but notwithstanding the tremendous achievements of Australians in generating great wealth and culture from the continent, the anxiety remains today. Australia is in search of a grand strategy for the new order. And your final remark, which is very searing, I think, in terms of where we go from here, and I won't read the whole paragraph, but um, the impact of COVID-19 is so severe that leaders in the US and China might once again decide that cooperation on the big risks of the day offers better prospects for advancing their interests. And this is the killer line, and you have worried about this for a while. Australia could find itself outside the conversation. Now, is that, you think like with a Biden presidency, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that they could find some resolution to this trade war and that we're sort of hanging out on a rock? Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, shag on a rock is the, is the phrase. Right, right. Um, yeah, no, and, and that was written, like I submitted the manuscript on the 1st of June. So um, I wrote that thinking that it wouldn't matter whether it was Trump or Biden, I had no view. And, and, and until the numbers came in, I had no view who might prevail. Uh, but it's based on a sort of realist view. And this is the thing, again, bringing realism back into our foreign policy and strategic discussions. These are great powers. They're going to deal with each other you know, on so many issues. And um, you know, America has turned on a dime on many occasions. And I begin the book with a bit of a reflection uh, on the Vietnam War years, which was formative for me. Um, I had to register just in December 72, the month Whitlam was elected, and he stopped uh, conscription. I come from a family of proud military service, Gallipoli, the Somme, uh, Al Alamein, uh, Papua New Guinea, are the men in the family, but I was uh, opposed to the Vietnam War and had terrible, terrible arguments. You know, we've had this conversation inside the family and it was a defining moment for me. But can you imagine? I mean, Gough Whitlam goes to Beijing in, uh, what is it, December 70, 70, 70 yeah, uh, July 70, yeah. and Billy McMahon gets up in the parliament, and we've got troops dying in Vietnam, and Billy McMahon gets up in the parliament and comes within a whisker of calling Gough Whitlam a traitor. Gough goes from Beijing to Shanghai to celebrate his 55th birthday, and the news comes through that who's turned up in Beijing? None other than Henry Kissinger. Busy chap on a Pakistan Airlines flight, uh, you know, from Islamabad. And, 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 and America turned on a dime. They didn't consult us. They didn't consult the Japanese. They didn't consult the Koreans who, like us, had guys dying on the ground as they, that's what great powers do. And we have to grow up. We simply have to grow up how, in how we deal with foreign policy. So that last sentence, Geraldine, wasn't about Trump or Biden. It was that the, the bet would have to be, given China's growth, ascendancy, power, capacity to influence. What we haven't talked about is my description of the new order, uh, which is something we don't ever talk about in Australia. The US will need to find an accommodation in its own interest, and that the US will come to discover that um, uh, the cost of trying to contain China is not worth the candle. But if they change, we will never know about it. We will read about it in the papers and our politicians will be left scrambling. And it's not to blame the United States. There is not one point of criticism of the United States in this. That's the real world we live in. That's what real powers do. American citizens would be appalled to think that Washington consulted allies in advance on some major strategic shift that affected US interests directly. So I just hope it's a salutary message that that, that conveys. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, I'll tell you, that last section's a sort of postscript on, on, on COVID world. Um, something else I think underpins what I'm saying. There was a lot of talk when COVID first hit and, and it was coming off discussion a bit before um, about decoupling. Yeah, let's decouple data. Da, da, da. Obviously, it's, it's almost impossible for us given the complementarity between the economies. US might be able to, to, to decouple, but guess what? And that's what I say in that last bit. 
China's happy with decoupling. They can decouple. They're, and I think that's why you don't hear so much about decoupling. Because uh, now you've got Xi Jinping's dual circulation, which is essentially sort of a fancy way of talking about import substitution. But when you sit in Beijing and you have to think about these issues as if you're sitting in Beijing, they look at the world and they see that they've got 1.4 billion people. They've created a middle class of at least 300 million people in about 20 years. And I think, well, if the rest of the world is going to give us grief, we don't actually need much from the rest of the world. And we'll generate our own technologies. We'll, we'll invest in AI. And yes, you can ban Huawei, but Huawei already is the digital backbone across Eurasia. And my vision, if I now can get it, of, 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 well, not my vision, my, my description of the new order is um, uh, an order of, of two great powers, US and China, the US presiding over essentially the remnants of the old liberal order and China, uh, the great power of Eurasia. And the more the Europeans, the Americans sanction Russia for bad behavior, the more Russia, although it doesn't like it, is drawn closer and closer to China. And so Huawei is the digital backbone across Eurasia and of course into Africa and much of West Asia. There is another world out there. And China's been very, very successful at what we call the institutional entrepreneurship. In 2003, they created the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Almost no one in Australia has heard of it. No one talks about it in foreign policy terms. But a couple of years ago, both India and Pakistan joined at the same time. And it's a massive security organization which is dedicated to be anti-Western. It's, it's not a small thing. The Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, I think, was a very good thing by China. Uh, it split our cabinet because Hillary Clinton got on to uh, Julie Bishop and said, this is terrible, this is China's sort of takeover. Eventually, sort of the economic people in Canberra prevailed, the Treasury and so on, and Abbott, who was swinging between the two, decided we'd join up. We joined six months after we were first approached. We were approached as the first developed country. That was when China thought we actually knew what we were doing. We could have taken, we could have joined and, and demanded in payment a deputy secretary job. Instead, the first Western country to join was the UK. Can you imagine Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank? I'll stop at this, sorry, you've got me on my hobby horse. But if you read Kurt Campbell, who could well be Secretary of State in the new Biden administration, if you read his memoirs or autobiography, whatever it's called, uh, he says specifically on the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, it was a big mistake by the US not to join. The world could have been different because Japan would have joined. There would have been a recognition of China's legitimacy and role and standing in the world, and it would have given them enormous face. I must say, I, went, I remember um, I went to a function where that was launched with one of the most elegant, impressive Chinese bureaucrats. I've forgotten his name, who was in charge of the AIIB. Oh, um, um, gosh, um, he was um, so um, impressive. And I remember. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was I, a I know small well. man, yes. just smart as it. Just, you know, when you look at somebody and you just think, you are something. You are really something. I, know, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. know who you are, but I just, everything about him, I just knew he mattered. Yeah. And I knew, therefore, that that uh, institution mattered. And I watched all the toing and froing, and we were just all over the place. Yeah. Well, if it, if, 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 it, if, it is, if it is the, uh, I just can't remember his name, I know him well, uh, current, current, Director General or Chairman I don't know or President, he still is, he, pre with the President, because we haven't followed the AWI. But either. yeah, no, no, we're, we're a member. We're, we are a member, yeah, yeah. But no one ever talks about no, it. I know. But but President, oh, doesn't matter. It'll come yeah. to you. Uh, but he had translated two thirds of Patrick White's The Vivi Sector. Oh, that that man had done that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, yeah. really? Yeah. Yes, there's a and, great interesting And, and, and read Shakespeare White. in in English, yes. and his daughter is a very serious professor of economics at the LSE. Yes, that's it. That's it. That's it. This, this yes, sort of starts to kind of you know, uh, undercut some of the stereotypes we've fed about China. Now, look, I'll sh we will both. I won't. Sh I will shut up. <laughs> uh, Sunny, are you going to take over the Q and A? Um, and uh, it's time for your questions. Jin, Jin Li Chun, sorry, Jin Li Chun, yes, I had to get it. it. Jin Li Chun, well Jin Li Chun. <laughs> Thank you so much, Geraldine. Thank you, Jeff. Now, if you've got a question for Jeff, please feel free to ask. 
I'll repeat the question for everyone at home on Facebook Live. Now, I should say it is a question, not a statement, rumination or meander. There's time enough for when you buy a book for Jeff to sign for you at the end for that. So remember, I will be listening for the inflection at the end, okay? <laughs> Who's got a question for Jeff? Guys, I'm, I'm intrigued um, why, um, first, your, your explanation of China's vulnerability in terms of worrying about access, in terms of limited ocean boundaries and things, makes such good sense. But also, I wonder why they bother, really, with the development of the islands, given that, really, strategically, in a big sense, it, if it came to a problem, the islands aren't going to help that much one way or the other. So it's certainly a statement. But, but I don't know why they bother with us. Why bother having our lobsters rot on their, rot on their docks at the end of the day? We're such small beer. Why not just enjoy our lobster, keep receiving our ore and, and make yeah. the most of it, and just treat us as we probably could be treated, which is irrelevant? I'll, I'll just uh, repeat that for everyone at face, on Facebook Live. So the question was, and I'll distill it, um, <laughs> It was very succinct. Why? <laughs> Given the vulnerabilities that Jeff has outlined for China in the South China Sea, why does China continue to aggravate world powers and you know neighbours by developing islands within the South China Sea and the Spratlys, etc.? And why is it so concerned with a small beer country like Australia leaving our lobsters to rot on the tarmac when they really should be less? shellfish and enjoy them. <laughs> Look, on the, uh, on the first one, the first question really, there's two questions there. The first one on the South China Sea. Yeah, look, I, I agree, it's a bit perplexing, but I think it goes to some of the points I was making about territorial integrity. And they've basically defined the South China Sea, the Nine Dash Line, as a core interest in terms of territorial integrity. and. It's no excuse. I mean, I think it's an overreach, just like the International Court of Justice thought it was an overreach. But I'm not a legal expert. But it's no excuse. But it needs to understand this is contested by many countries, the area. And Taiwan claimed exactly the same area as Communist China. And there's a strong view, rightly or wrongly, I don't claim expertise, that. Um, Japan had claimed the same area themselves. And when, at the end of the Second World War, uh, and Japan, Japanese territory was being handed back, colonial territory was being handed back, this was handed to Taiwan. And so Beijing sees that it's a legitimate heir yeah. of occupancy over those. Um, if the strategic value, I agree, is probably minimal. On Australia, it's really a good question as well. I mean, both good questions. But I worry that we are maybe manoeuvring ourselves into a point exactly as you say. Uh, China might just give up on us. Who cares? Um, and, I mean, lobster's easy to substitute, as is wine. I'm sure the Cana our, our Five Eyes colleagues in Canada and New Zealand are cheering <laughs> at our current discomfort because they're going to sell more New Zealand wine and more Canadian lobsters. Um, and the US as well uh, will do pretty well out of Alaska. Uh, but there is an issue I think we need to come to grips with quickly that China may just not care. Mm. And the thing is, it's asymmetrical. And I think we need to understand that as well in a very much a realist foreign policy sense. We need China more than they need us. Not just in transactional terms, although that's pretty important. Anything we want to do to advance our security either requires China's support or acquiescence. If China wishes to oppose any initiative we wish to take, regionally or globally, it's finished. Does that mean we lose our sovereignty? No. It means we have to work with them. Because that is what is really seems to be utterly preoccupying certain groups of people in Canberra, and it's no use wishing it away. It's there. That anxiety is there. The anxiety is there, but where is our sovereignty under threat? It's just like all this talk about values. Our values, we're protecting our values. But what values are under threat? I mean, I, it's, 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 you know, these, we have to learn to work with countries that are different. And, uh, we haven't had a lot of experience of that. Have that's we? true. But, well, see, look, he, we have to like them. But this is, my, this is a point in the book, and I'm very strong on this. This is, dystopias, this is Australia's dystopian foreign policy future I write about in the book. I mean, really, if China is such an overweening threat and we need to uh, bulk up against China, then we would be going to Philippines, for example, all the time. 
But guess what? Philippines actually shares our values. Mm. Democratically elected government, uh, a genuine democracy, robust you know, media, uh, a president who is a serial human rights abuser, which we don't like, <laughs> but who happens to have 85% popularity. Come on, this is what's the problem. If, if you move away from interests, then you get yourself into this netherworld of contradictions. Yeah. It's like, we lost, no, no, I'm not blaming Australia, but the West, right? We lost Laos and Cambodia. They are Chinese puppets. We rushed to Myanmar when they started to have elections. And then with the Rohingya, which is a terrible human rights yeah. abuse, we have nothing to do with Myanmar, but Myanmar is still by itself trying to push back against China. Mm -hmm. if, if, if we are hard-headed foreign policy realists, we would be embracing Myanmar. Yeah, generally, that's, that's the reality of being a relatively small country in a dystopic world. And that's the whole notion. I mean, the publisher didn't like me using the word dystopian. Yeah. I said, but that's, that's a key point. And it's to shock Australians to begin to understand that, that is, they're the choices, and they're pretty limited, that we have to make. And to be fair, Geraldine, I mean, I seem to remember how well the former Human Rights Commissioner, Gillian Triggs, was treated by the Australian government for many years. Yeah. Um, and China has rightly criticised Australia on aspects of our treatment of people, whether Indigenous mm. or refugee. Although I'd like to ask you, Jeff, I mean, when we look at... Anglo-Saxon settler countries like New Zealand, Australia, Canada, the United States, they've all been based or had big political movements or legislation based on a fear of the yellow peril. Um, I wonder how, given that the pretty much the second or third act passed by federal parliament was the immigration restriction policy, the white Australia policy to prevent you know, white slavery and the influence of Asiatics upon Australia for the working man, which you might remember was the masthead of the bulletin until 1967. <laughs> How much of that fear of China has kind of created a sense that China is an immovable object or a kind of imminent threat when, when we can see it, with China's um, it clashes with India up in Kashmir and Ladakh, that there's speculation by many in the geopolitical and diplomatic community that the Chinese army, given that they spend so, the PLA spends so much on it, as you pointed out, internal security as opposed to external security, may actually be a paper tiger or paper dragon. Oh, there are a couple of questions there. <laughs> <laughs> Don't Quite do what I did. <laughs> yeah, um, look, the fear of the other is ever present in Australia. And I think there are a lot of very concerned and serious people who worry that the China threat industry in Australia uh, morphs over into something other. And I do think that Senator Abetz's statements or uh, demanding uh, mm. three Chinese Australians who appear before his committee to make some sort of loyalty statement and disavow mm. the Chinese Communist Party uh, I presume he's asked the same of Gladys Liu. Well, maybe, but that was, but that really was something that just is against Australian values. So, if you're talking about defending Australian values, I haven't seen China offend Australian values as much as that. Mm. So, I think that that we have to be very careful with this domestic discussion. Uh, on the other one of China being a paper tiger, I'm joking a bit. But I heard Geraldine say, "Oh no, it's not a paper." Well, unlike the Americans, who have been in constant war for the last thirty years, and we pretty much well. Has, have, have as well. Uh, Chinese army hasn't fought a, a war, a, a real war, since '79. They've had a, a clash, first in 40 years uh, in Ladakh, Ladakh in uh, June. The last time they fought a war was uh, 1979 against Vietnam, and they were defeated. And so, when I first met the Beijing as ambassador, and all oh, this is like 2007, already everyone's getting anxious about Chinese military build-up, modernization. Sure, they like the North Koreans could be brilliant just uh, uh, military parades on, on auspicious days. But frankly, my experience at PLA is that it had, you know, it was full of uh, dancing girls, drivers, cooks, you know, you name it, uh, actresses, film groups. You know, when you look at the PLA numbers, 
All that stuff's in the numbers as well. It's got a huge movie industry. <laughs> channel 5, which is 24-7 on CCTV television, is the PLA channel. And they show the PLA defeating the same Japanese over and over again, 24-7. So, and, and, and uh, you know, the dancing girls, at their office, and the parade people. If you go to the Great Hall, the people, you know, the Prime Minister comes, there's a fabulous parade or whatever. It's amazing, these extraordinarily tall Chinese soldiers, and hundreds of them, everyone is exactly the same height, even to the tip of their peaks of their caps. So um, there's a huge effort goes into non-combat roles in the PLA. Robert. Um, just a quick question. Um, do you view the limit of very incisive and scathing Announcement, I think, of where we're up to with our relations with China. My question is, who gets the primary blame for this? Is this a failure of the political class, or is it contributed to by the um, intelligence and security committee and a, and a lesser standing with the Department of Foreign Affairs? Who's to blame, and who should really move on this? I'll just repeat that for yep. everyone at home. Um, so. Who's, you've delivered a very scathing assessment of our declining re relationship with China. Who's responsible for this? Is it the political class? Is it the military intelligence sector? Is it the diplomatic class? Who exactly is responsible and how has it happened? Well, Robert, quite a few things there. Um, first of all, I think we, we, we must begin with China's own behaviour. I mean, China's behaviour has changed. China has become a more assertive, uh, a more difficult country to deal with. Uh, and it's clearly ramped up foreign interference, not only in Australia, around the world, cyber warfare, you name it. They're not alone, but they're in our face in that respect. But that's what you'd expect a rising great power to do. And again, I, I, I don't think you can conduct foreign policy on good and bad and right and wrong, but that's just what we have to deal with. Then you come to us how we've responded. What we're dealing with is the biggest power shift in modern history ever. And we are singularly unprepared for it. Singularly, uh, our, our, our diplomatic efforts are underfunded. We haven't had uh, proper leadership from the Minister of Foreign Affairs for many, many years, going back to the Rudd years. I, I, I mean, I work closely with Alexander Downer when he was Foreign Minister, I was Deputy Secretary. I don't think we've had a strong uh, foreign minister since Downer's time. Uh, and in this world where uh, US dominance has been challenged by the ascendant power, we have decided to hew closely to the Americans. We are joined at the hip of the Americans. And my feeling is all of that, given everything else, is driven largely by the intelligence, security, uh, defence establishment. And it's impossible to exaggerate how close the Australian community is with the US community. Australian defence community. Defence community, intelligence mm -hmm. especially, uh, and strategic community. I mean, Andrew Shearer, who's just uh, now been promoted ahead of ONI, on one of his, one of his many stints when the Liberals were out of power, you know, he spent most of that time with one of the most conservative Washington-based think tanks. They'll pick you up, they'll look after you, park you, until uh, you can go back into uh, uh, office. So I really think that uh, that needs to be understood in Australia. And there is just a, uh, a perpetual weakness in, in foreign affairs. Yes? So we've t talked a lot about exports tonight, but Australia is increasingly becoming dependent on service industries like tourism and education, which have been deeply impacted by COVID. So do you see any way for us to be able to recover after COVID, especially in light of our relationship with China? Well, thank you. That's a very helpful question because it really does lead into, I think, what everyone wants to know, what can we do? And I would 
really just to, you know, implore the Prime Minister to at least even float the idea of the rest of, of the creation of a travel bubble between Australia and China. Mm -hmm. We've done well on COVID, they've done well on COVID. Keep it constrained initially to the education sector, if you like. I think it should be education plus, you know, business. Um, and see how it all goes and tracks and pans out. Now, I think if the Prime Minister actually said, look, you know, we've got to support jobs uh, in our education sector, uh, we've got all these economic interests with China, uh, COVID was a, an external shock, it came from nowhere, hit us, but there's no reason why we can't recognise how well China's done and they can't recognise how we've done and get together a travel bu bubble. I think a concrete statement, a, an indication, a forward-looking thing from the Prime Minister like that would probably recalibrate the bilateral relationship as well, almost overnight. And then there are other steps with the, that we could take beyond that. But so thank you, because I, I really think that's an extremely important thing we can do. And the, the, the figures came out the other day, just this week, that actually the travel agents from China said there's incredible interest still in Australia Interesting. from yeah. average show. Yeah. Very big numbers still wanting to come. You know, Interesting, yes. Worst thoughts. Yeah. They want to still yeah. come. And of course, these sorts of travel bubble initiatives that we could take, and I think China, frankly, I know China well enough, I think, to know that they wouldn't propose it in fear of being rejected. Yeah. Okay. So it comes to us. Yeah. But for us to do it is not being weak need. Mm. It's not making a concession. It's not being supine. It's just understanding how they think and operate and what's in our interest. We're proposing it not because we want to suck up to China, but we have you know university classrooms that could be filled with fee-paying students and accommodation mm. that could be filled with, with yeah. Chinese students. And as it was reported today, it's a two and a half billion dollar loss to the Sydney economy as a result of international students not going to restaurants, paying rent, and a ten and a half billion dollar hit to our third biggest export. One last question. I, I saw a few hands up before. Oh, yes. So, I, I was also just going to say, I wonder if it's, to me, they've got this internal social credit system. Uh, is there some sort of external social credit system that they're applying to? Their, their, <laughs> 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 their foreign relationships now? So, the first part of the question was, um, China seems to be signalling that it wants Australia to do something. What is it? And going off on a black mirror tangent, given that China has its own internal <laughs> social credit system, does it have an external or diplomatic social credit system as well? And where do you think Australia fits in that? Um, we won't go near the last question. No. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the whole notion of a Sino-Centric order. Uh, but look, I, I mean, I think, uh, as I said, China's looking for some signaling and I wrote an AFR column three weeks ago um, saying that there were two events that I think clearly indicated China wanted to put a floor under things. Um, the speech at the end of August by Wang Ximing, the deputy head of the embassy in Canberra, made at the National Press Club, it was very conciliatory. And then a couple of weeks ago, a report by Mike Smith in the AFR based on written questions he'd submitted to Fu Ying, the former Chinese ambassador. She's got a lot of influence still in Beijing. Um, and that was very conciliatory as well. Uh, we never responded. I don't think, I don't think we recognised it was conciliatory. Uh, I don't think it's um, going to damage Australia's national security for me, for me to say that a former close colleague from DFAT gave me a dressing down over my article and basically said, look, it's got nothing, it's not up to us. China's, China's at fault, China's done everything wrong, and we don't have to do anything. Like, you know, this is not how you conduct diplomacy, but anyway. Um, and then uh, we've had the Senator Abetz statement, and then the Secretary of DFAT did not distance herself from that, but simply said in Senate estimates last week, that it was a tactical blunder. The Chinese will use it against us. 
So I don't think it helps. It, none of this helps. And, 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 but I think there are things, as I said, I mean, a, a forward-looking statement taken right out of the context of the bilateral relationship. They have to talk about the bilateral relationship. It's just talk about our interests. We want to make money out of China. We want to make money out of China. We're not rolling over and having our tummy tickle. We just want to make money. Be as crude and crass as that. And I think that would be interpreted by Beijing as a very positive single. <laughs> single. <laughs> Welcome to the realist world of foreign policy. <laughs> In which some might say all the bets are off. Oh. <laughs> well Thank you so much, Jeff and Geraldine, for a wonderful, enlightening and engaging conversation. Please, everybody, yeah. join me in thanking you. Thank you. China's grand strategy in Australia's place in the new global world order is published by Melbourne University Press, and you can buy a signed copy from Jeff. He'll be outside signing copies for you. You can also purchase online on the um, on Facebook Live. Just put in, click on the link in the comments, or go to the Roaring Stories website where you can sign up for newsletters, events, interviews, and blogs with and from your favourite authors, and much, much more. I'm Sunil Badami, and it's been such a pleasure having your company today, uh, tonight, here at the Royal Oak and on Facebook Live. And I look forward to seeing you again. She was on Q&A last night. She won't be at the National Press Club tomorrow. Jeff will. But she'll be with us next Tuesday, the 16th of November. It's Professor Jenny Hocking talking about the intrigue, secrets and explosive revelations underneath the palace letters. Her new book, about the dismissal. I look forward to seeing you then. You can book on Facebook Live or on the Roaring Stories website and I'll hopefully see you then or in the store. Thanks very much. Yeah.